Welcome everybody to our program today, The Amazing Bertha Palmer. I'm Becky, I'm a librarian with Hillsborough County Public Library. I'm here today with our presenter, Sarah. Sarah, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello everybody, my name is Sarah Baker and I am a docent and a volunteer at the Tampa Bay History Center. And we cover 14,000 years of history in Tampa and Florida. And uh, today we're not going back 14,000 years. We'll be in the 19th century and early 20th century. All right, thank you, Sarah. So everybody, today I'm going to be speaking about a very extraordinary, talented, intelligent, successful, and unusual woman, particularly unusual for the times that she lived. She was extraordinary. So Bertha Mathilde Honoré was born in 1849 in Louisville, Kentucky. And her family later moved to Chicago where her father became a real estate developer. And that was going to influence the rest of her life. So over the course of time, Bertha developed a reputation as a skilled musician, a proficient linguist, a brilliant writer, an able politician, a fine administrator, and much, much more that we'll talk about in a, in a bit. Um, her interests in public causes would eventually make her a national and international personality. And by the time the 20th century rolled around, Bertha would become one of the largest landholders and developers in Florida, which was very unusual for a woman. In fact, her business interests helped contribute to the land boom and the development of the Gulf Coast of Florida. Quite remarkable for somebody of her time. Um, in 1870, uh, Bertha married a man by the name of Potter Palmer. And he was born in 1826 and was 23 years older than she was. Um, so when they got married, she was 21 and he was 44. They had been introduced by, Pot, by Palmer's first former business partner, whose name happened to be Marshall Field. If anybody knows the Chicago area, they will know that name. Additionally, Palmer was a friend of Bertha's father. So originally, Potter was a merchant and a real estate promoter who had established a dry goods store that had the unprecedented policy of permitting buyers to return any purchase that they didn't like, that didn't satisfy them. So in 1865, Potter was 39 at the time, he sold his establishment to two young men. And one of them, their name was Marshall Field, if you've heard of that name. And Potter's return policy actually became the cornerstone of the great success of the Marshall Field Company. Before Potter reached the age of 40, he had actually amassed $7 million, which was a lot of money during that period of time. So Potter Palmer had started out as a Quaker dry goods merchant who came to Chicago after he had failed twice in business already. But his line of, in his line of work, he had learned how to please his customers, many of them women. And by making customer service a priority, he became very successful. He carried everything from dry goods to the latest fashions, particularly French fashions for the ladies. Now, Palmer had also invested in real estate and he owned a vast portfolio of properties. So after he became engaged to Bertha, he began building one of the most extravagant wedding gifts of all time, the luxurious Palmer House, which you can see right there. Now, a year after their wedding, the grand opening of the Palmer House was on September 26, 1871, that happened to be just 13 days before the great Chicago fire. And that in fact 
caused the, the new brand new Palmer House to burn down. The fire also happened to kill 300 people. Now, Palmer House was wiped out along with most of the couple's holdings, but they were able to rebuild the Grand Hotel, thanks to Palmer getting a $1.7 million loan, which at the time was the largest loan, individual loan ever given. But it was actually Bertha's encouragement of her husband that they remain in Chicago. And she is quoted as saying the following, it is our duty to stay and devote any fortunes and energies to rebuilding this stricken area. And you could see the mess after the fire here. Ultimately, Potter was responsible for much of the development of Chicago's downtown area and the Lakeshore Drive area. So, two years later, on November 8, 1873, the sumptuous Palmer House, a mecca for the biggest spenders, reopened. You could see that here, boasting every luxury of the day. Now that included, there were silver dollars set into the floor on the main ballroom. Uh, ballroom. Some of the visiting luminaries included Ulysses Grant, Mark Twain, Charles Dickens, Oscar Wilde, and they made the building fireproof and they advertised that, which was very important. And they had a European plan and an American plan. One of those plans, it came with food, the other one, it did not. By the way, in 1945, this hotel was purchased by Conrad Hilton and today remains one of the company's flagship properties. Now, despite Bertha being so young at the time, she was only 24 years old, she had greatly influenced Potter to reestablish his fortune. In part, it was due to her guidance, and she had a very unusually shrewd nature. She was amazing. So Bertha is 25 years old. She gives birth to her first son, Honoré, in 1875. Um, and then the following year to her second son, Potter Palmer II. At the same time, she was also a member of many Chicago's women's clubs. She wasn't a homemaker, that's for sure. And she, was, she worked with women where, where they discussed their social problems and how to, dis, how to develop solutions. They did things like supporting kindergartens until the city made them part of the school system. They also campaigned for inexpensive milk for impoverished children and better care for children whose mothers were imprisoned. Now, aside from all her good deeds, Bertha had a relationship with money. <laughs> she was famous for her free spending ways and her husband indulged her. Her jewel collection was legendary and it ranked as one of the greatest. Um, now, Potter was a cold and diffident man to the outside world, but he showed his love of Bertha with a gift after gift of jewels and anything she wanted, pretty much. His friend, Marshall Field, disapproved of, of Potter's largesse with his wife. He didn't think that was right for a woman to be granted these things. Now, when Bertha's husband died in 1902 at the age of 76, he left her his entire fortune, which was worth $8 million, a lot of money back then, the equivalent today of about $180 million. And his friend Marshall Field publicly asserted, well, I think a million dollars would be enough for one woman. So, after her death at the age of 69, Bertha had doubled his, this fortune, as well as she had homes outside the US. She had a home in London and in Paris. And she traveled throughout Europe and dined with kings and queens and statesmen. Now, this is interesting. In his will, Potter dictated that a sum of money 
should go to whomever Bertha decides to marry next. When asked why he would do such a thing, he replied, because the gentleman will need it. So, now Bertha also spent vast sums on the sh where she lived. And this picture is the Palmer Mansion in Chicago. Very beautiful. Now, besides her gorgeous mansion, her clothing and accessories were breathtaking. You could see the picture of the room there. And in this photo, the gown that you see is silk, satin, and crepe. Her shoes were silk and velvet, and there were numerous diamonds in her bracelet. By the way, Bertha never did remarry. She was also beautiful, dashing, quick. We know she was smart, and she was very, very sure of herself. Not merely an investor, Mrs. Potter Palmer, as the papers called her, also shined in high society. She was a visible feminist, a champion of the working class and women's rights. Um, Bertha also became an avid art collector. And this is introduced. She was introduced to Parisian painters and became a client of a Parisian dealer. As a result, she began collecting Fre French Impressionist works, including 29 Monets, 11 Renoirs, and a Muradin. These works now form the core of the Art Institute of Chicago's Impressionist collection. Bertha even once sat for Rodin. Now, we'll talk a little bit about Susan B. Anthony here and how she connects to this story. As early as 1889, Susan B. Anthony, who was president of the National Women's Suffrage Association, began planning ahead for the upcoming 1892 Chicago, Chicago World's Fair which commemorated Columbus's 1492 voyage and the city's recovery from the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. Now, Anthony had been excluded from the previous 1876 Philadelphia uh, centennial festivities, and that taught her a lesson that women must be part of the action and the planning. And she knew that she had to act early to promote women's issues at, at national events, like the New World's Fair. So Susan B. Anthony realized something else in her efforts for the World's Fair, if they were going to succeed. If they were going to succeed, if she was going to succeed, a known feminist like herself could not be visible. So she quietly gathered petition signatures from 111 wives and daughters of judges of the Supreme Court, the cabinet, senators, representatives, army and navy officers, and influential, as influential a list that the national capital could offer. And since men in Congress could not refuse the women of their own households, the men created a 115 member board of lady managers comprising representatives from each state to oversee women's activities at this new international event, the World's Fair. Now, enter Bertha Palmer, sh the shrewd businesswoman leading the life on both the national and international scene. Plus, Bertha was a liberal Democrat, a supporter of the suffrage movement, and she had encouraged working class women to unionize. Now that's a picture of a promotional flyer um, of for this for the women's part of the did something go on for the women's part of this exhibition. So Bertha was selected for the plum position of heading the lady, the board of lady managers for the 1892 World's Fair. And here's a picture of her on this promotional flyer. And in this position, she gained experience in advertising and promoting, 
and she immediately set about to make the fair an, explor an exploration of women's status worldwide, not just America. So in this position, what she did, she went abroad and she made her pitch directly to kings, queens, prime ministers, princesses, duchesses, everybody, everybody important. And to those who didn't speak English, she spoke flawless French. As a result, she received the support of governmental and social leaders of numerous countries. There was one exception, however. This is an interesting story. It was the famous snub by the Infanta Eulalia. Now, this woman was the Princess of Spain and the World, World's Fair's representative of the Spanish throne, which, by the way, had underwritten Christopher Columbus's journey 400 years earlier. She was given a red carpet treatment and lodged in the royal suite of the Palmer House with a staff of serv servants. She was then invited to a reception and champagne supper at Bertha's mansion, which was a special honor and she accepted. Until, that is, she learned that Mrs. Potter Palmer, her hostess, was the spouse of the owner of the hotel she was staying at. She exploded and said, I will not attend an innkeeper's wife's event. And she canceled. And that was that. Nevertheless, Bertha's glittering success established her as the darling of reporters and much of the American public. But like any task force, the board's women had personality conflicts as well as rivalries. But Bertha was able to successfully manage and control clashing egos. And she, she created what still may rank as the world's greatest single event furthering women's causes. But her problems were also exacerbated by the women's relative inexperience with some of the work, as well as by the auditors of the World's Fair who were very suspicious of women's abilities to manage money. So let me read this article that appeared in a Kansas newspaper, the Atchison Champion. And it said, nine tenths of these wives, mothers, sisters, and daughters don't want suffrage, never asked for it, and object to its responsibilities being thrust upon them. The women who want suffrage are generally uneasy old maids wives whose married life has been an unhappy experience, and a few females of the Gitto temperament without his murderous tendencies, that is, of vast aspirations, but with feeble capacities. The true women of America never have joined in the demand for women's suffrage. So this is something she had to deal with. But despite all this, Bertha's committee sent out a huge number of letters to women all over the globe, inviting them to get involved. And when the exposition opened on Columbus Day of 1892, women were in complete control of their area, which included 80,000 exhibits from 47 nations portraying the diversity of women's lives. Now, this is a picture of the woman's building. So during the, the year-long fair, approximately 10 million people saw the, saw the women's exhibits that was in this building. And this is an interesting note. A female architect, Sophia Hayden, she was the one who designed it. And she was the first female graduate in architecture at MIT. There were also female artists and sculptors who decorated this building. 
and all the music there was performed and composed by women. So during one week, one week, 150,000 women from 27 nations participated in seminars and networking, from which many women's organizations subsequently grew. Sadly, however, the only members who had to fight to participate in the expo were black American women, and only a few were flat allowed to speak at the on the agenda. Now, eight years later, 1892, as a result of Bertha's success, she was appointed by President William McKinley as the only woman member of the National Commission to represent the US at the 1900 Paris World Fair. And this assignment brought her even more contacts, including the future King of England, who became a friend and a frequent guest in her house. So with the turn of the 20th century, Bertha was to become something more. She would become an important addition to the ranks of Florida as a promoter, a large landowner, a rancher, a farmer, and a developer. In fact, her varied business interests in Sarasota contribute to the, contributed to the further development and the land boom of the Gulf Coast. Now, all of this began with her Florida connection during a nasty blizzard in Chicago in the winter of 1910, uh, when Bertha saw a classified ad in the newspaper about tracts of land suitable for citrus growing along Sarasota Bay in, quote, warm and sunny Florida, not cold Chicago. Now, her husband had died in uh, 1902, and so by now, most of her widowhood was ultimately spent in Florida, where its climate was, was far better. So in 1910, she bought over 80,000 acres of land in and around Sarasota, leading the movement to open up Florida's peninsula south of Tampa Bay. When she first sighted Sarasota, it was a small rundown and jungle-like coastal village populated by poor fishermen and struggling farmers. But she fell in love with it, envisioning what the area could become. She stated, in fact, that Sarasota Bay was more beautiful than the Bay of Naples. She selected a site, a home site for herself on Little Sarasota Bay in a community called Osprey on Spanish Point, where she built her dream mansion. And you can see a picture of it, just gorgeous. She called it the Oaks. It was on 350 acres. And by building this, she had ended up putting 300 unemployed men to work, making it a show place, which she furnished lavishly. Soon the Palmer residence became a center for transplanted socialites as the social world beat a path to her door from Chicago, as well as other Midwestern areas and Easterners. New hotels and rooming houses were built to accommodate all the arrivals. And thus, Bertha played an extensive role in making Sarasota the city of the arts. Today, many elements of Bertha's lavish formal, formal gardens and lawns have re been restored at Spanish Point. See a picture of that. But Bertha wasn't done with what she was gonna do. She still had a lot more on her plate to do. She established a land developing company with her brother and sons as officers. She became involved in farming and ranching activities and started a thousand acre hog farm, which later expanded to cattle and poultry. Soon she purchased a 6,000 acre ranch 
and 3,000 head of cattle and embarked on an experiment to improve Florida's cattle stock. She also was a member of the Florida State Livestock Association and developed new techniques and innovations in the field of cattle ranching and improved production. One of these was the use of large concrete vats where the animals were dipped in medicines and insect repellents. With this practice, she showed old time cracker ranchers how to fight the scourge of the cattle business, the pesky tick. And it was quickly adopted by other ranchers and still continues today. Now on her 90,000 acres in Southwest Florida, where she studied cattle breeding and disease prevention, she fenced in 30,000 acres to protect her scientific research. And then she had to stand up to angry cattlemen who were only accustomed to the open range and she prevailed. Bertha also moved into citrus farming and acquired a large grapefruit grove of 1300 acres. She also demonstra demonstrated to local uh, farmers that celery could be raised as a profitable commercial cash crop. Additionally, she still wasn't finished. In 1914, Bertha bought 15,000 acres of land in an area that would later become Temple Terrace, where she built an exclusive hunting preserve called River Hills Park. She and her guests stayed at two large lodges there near the Hillsborough River, which later became part of the Florida College. Only one of the original buildings from the hunting preserve remains today. That's now known as the Woodmont Club, Clubhouse, and its grounds have some of the largest specimens of live oak and long leaf pine in the city because they had escaped earlier logging. They were lucky. Bertha also had the vision to develop the Temple Terrace property into a golf course community surrounded by citrus groves, but she never got to realize that dream. Now, in addition to all the land she already had, by 1916, Bertha also acquired massive tracts of land in southeastern Hillsborough County near Baum. So Riverview was to the north, Apollo Beach to the west, Waimama to the south, that area. As well as she bought in Virginia Park and the Maryland sub Manor subdivisions of South Tampa and Interbay. But Bertha's innovations and nonstop activities, however, came to an end when she developed cancer. Despite a mastectomy, breast cancer killed her on the eve of her 69th birthday, which came two years before women won the vote. When she died, May 15, 1918, Bertha had been living in the Oaks in Osprey, Florida, south of Sarasota. Her body was returned to Chicago and she was buried alongside her husband in Graceland Cemetery. After her death, her son sold the Temple Terrace land to developers who in 1920 created the Medita Mediterranean Revival Golf Course Community of Temple Terrace, one of the first such communities in the U.S. Bertha's brother, Honoré, uh, Adrian Honoré, who was a trustee of her estate, sold the land to new owners who formed two corporations. They formed Temple Terrace Estates, Inc., which developed the golf course and residential area, and Temple Terraces, Inc., which developed 5,000 acres of orange groves that surrounded the city and actually became the largest orange grove in the world. Amazing. As one of the first famous people to winter in the west, on the west coast of Florida, Bertha had encouraged wealthy friends and associates to spend winters along Sarasota Bay, where her land is still known as Palmer Ranch. After her death, a large parcel of the land was donated or some of it sold uh, by her sons to become the Mayaka River State Park, 
one of eight Florida state parks developed during the 1930s. This is a picture of uh, Bertha leading 60 Chicago women in a march for the vote. And this is a slot, this is a plaque that can be found in Venice, Florida, which says 1910, Bertha Honore Palmer acquired 140,000 acres of area land, which included most of Venice. And that is the story of Bertha Palmer, indeed a very, very extraordinary woman for her time. All right, thank you so much. That was amazing. I learned so much and I'm sure the rest of our audience has as well. I did not know that one woman did all of that. That's amazing. She must have had, you know, she, she was very sure of herself. They, they said that when she was younger as well. Mm -hmm. She was right. extraordinary, but she was also had the good fortune of having married into, you know, a good situation. Yes, definitely. If, uh, and for our audience members who may have joined late, please make sure you submit any questions into the question box. And if you haven't already submitted your questions, you can do so now. We're just going to go and get into our question portion. Um, kind of going on what you were saying, uh, what do, one of our questions is, what do you think made Bertha so unique for her time? You know, I think it was inherent, her character. When her husband's um, new hotel burnt down, she was the one who encouraged him. She had guts. She was also extremely smart. And girls were not sent off to university to find, you know, get their careers. She was just very, very clever. Today, she would be an ambassador or, you know, president of the United States, perhaps. She definitely seemed very ambitious and she made yes. sure that her goals were achieved as well. Very impressive. Um, another question, uh, is there an exhibit on Bertha at the History Center? No, there isn't. Okay. There is not, I've been asked that. <laughs> no, I sure. will submit that though to the people who have the power to do that. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's a great suggestion. Uh, how did you become a docent with the History Center? Well, when I moved to Florida, I was under the impression that Florida really didn't have much history, mm -hmm. that it didn't become alive until air conditioning was invented. And I saw an ad in the paper when the History Center started to build the new building which was in, what year was that, Shelley? Um, 2000, yeah, 11 years ago. Okay. And, and I went and um, I, became a, I became a docent and then you study all the material and it turns out that there's incredible history in Florida going back human history, 14,000 years. Mm -hmm. And you know, the Seminole story, everything. It's it's really a very rich history. That's true. Oh, let me see. What what brought you to be interested in Bertha Palmer in the first place? How did you hear about her? Oh, somebody was talking about it, and you know, feminist issues. Women, particularly in the Victorian time, when you hear of that that period of time, women standing out and trying to to fight for, for their rights, um, I, I was just drawn to it, um, being a somewhat feminist <laughs> in our world. Sure. No. Uh, someone suggested um, saying that, I believe Bertha was also responsible for inventing brownies. I don't know if that part's true. Oh, <laughs> or I, just a rumor. I, I don't but, know. I may have read something. I did. I I don't know the story about that. Okay. So there's some yeah. kind of connection there, at least. Yes. Yes, there is. There is. Okay. I'm sorry. That'd be, interesting. That'd be interesting to look into after. No, because I was curious about that, too. I mean, who doesn't like a brownie? Yeah. All right. I think that. that. Yeah, I'll definitely have to after the after this program. 
All right, I think that's actually it for our questions. Uh, yeah, I was the uh, sorry. Someone actually followed up on that and said, "I think they were okay. invented at the Palmer House, so maybe they were not necessarily invented by Bertha, but maybe just at her house." But knowing Bertha, she probably told them what to put in the cookie. <laughs> she made some <laughs> suggestions. <laughs> All right, thank you everybody for your questions. Those are great and we'll have to follow up on that brownie. All right, <laughs> so before we come to a close, I do wanna go and invite everybody to continue the experience here. We have uh, two books we can recommend, two eBooks. There is The Sun Coast Empire by Frank A. Cassell, and it can provide you more details on the life of Bertha Palmer and her impact on Sarasota. And we also have They Dare to Dream, by Doris Weatherford would highlights a variety of Florida women who helped to shape history. Both of these books are available through the Libby app, which can be accessed on the library website at hcplc.org slash ebooks. And here is our contact page. If you have any questions for the library, you can always reach us at our website, hcplc.org slash connect, or you can give us a call at 813-273-3652. The Tampa Bay History Center can be reached at their website, tampabayhistorycenter.org. We do have more library programs and events coming up, including more events for Women's History Month, and you can check those out at hcplc.org events, where you can register for any of our virtual events. I want to thank all of our audience members for joining us tonight. Everybody who's great, and I had fabulous questions. And I want to thank Sarah for presenting this program and teaching us so much about Bertha Palmer. All right, thank you, everybody. I hope you all have a wonderful night. <laughs>